Go to the book of John, chapter 9. I will go back to my Old Testament study. It's kind of like the Spirit must want me to clear some files, (laughs) address issues, and be specific. And there's not as much liberty to... um, just preach whatever I want, as you might think. Well, connected with John 8, John 9 is John 8, 59. So we'll start there. Then they took up stones to cast at him. That's Jesus. They hated Jesus. (laughs) I mean, that's just shocking, really. Best person ever lived. Kindest, loving, healing, beautiful, true. They take up stones, they're going to kill him. What? They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. Well, how do you know we got a God that hides himself? Sometimes he reveals himself, and sometimes you have to seek him. I mean, this is another subject for another time, but why do we have a God that hides himself? Have you noticed that in the book of Psalms? Like, oh God, how long are you going to be so far away? How long are you going to hide yourself from me? Why do we have a God that hides himself? If you ever think about it, he always gives us just enough of himself to where you know he's real and you can't deny that, but never so much that you don't have trial and and situation. It's a perfect balance. And sometimes you can feel like God is sitting right there in the room with you. And the next day you might feel like he's a million miles away if there even is a God. We got a God that hides himself. I think part of the reason why he hides himself is that um, because he wants to draw us out and to seek him for even seeking him. The process of seeking him is so important for us. But in this case, he hid himself because they wanted to kill him so they couldn't see him. In other words, in a way, they're blind. It's terrible to be blind, but it'd be really terrible to be spiritually blind if you can't see. And what is salvation? I mean, even the most famous gospel song, I mean, it may as well be America's national anthem. I wish it was, really. Amazing grace. How's it go? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Salvation is seeing. Isn't that the truth? When it actually comes, I mean, all of a sudden you see. And you wonder, why didn't I see that before? I've literally heard people tell me that they uh, started to notice birds and flowers after they got saved. (laughs) All of a sudden you see God's creation. You see other things. I saw something I'd never seen before. The body of Christ. Didn't even know it existed. All of a sudden, boom, there's a whole world out there. Your eyes get open. I saw why Jesus died on the cross. As a Catholic, I used to look at a crucifix and wonder. But when Jesus opened my eyes, it was as clear as a bell. He died for my sins. He took my place as a substitute. I could see. But they couldn't see Jesus because they hated him and wanted to kill him. And he went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. They couldn't even see him, though he went right by them. You know how dreadful that'd be to be so blind that Jesus walks right by you and you don't even see him? Jesus is doing something right in front of your eyes and you don't see him? Or Jesus is working in a circumstance or a situation and you think you've got to figure it out and you don't even see that it's him? It's not everybody else. It's not all the bad people or the evil. It's him. You can't see him, though, because there is two kinds of vision and two kinds of blindness. So the next verse, because there is no chapter break in the original Gospel of John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And believe it or not, in that day... That was a rational question because most blindness was a result of venereal disease of the parents. They didn't put drops and stuff like that like people do now. 
So a lot of blindness came from venereal disease. But that still is only a natural question. And so Jesus answers in a very unique and often misunderstood way. Verse 3, uh, three neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So he doesn't even really answer the question. The, the answer to the question, what caused this, you would have to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And Jesus doesn't bother to do that here, although Paul does in Romans 5. The answer to every question like that, what went wrong? How did this person get born blind? Why is there an earthquake in India? Why do these people uh, have this disease? You can't go back far enough. And if you're asking that question about your own life, where did I go wrong? Sometimes people think they got the answer. Oh, it was in seventh grade. I looked at a dirty book and read a, spoke to joint. That's where everything went wrong. You have not gone back far enough. You got to go back to the garden to find out what went wrong. But Jesus is in a different direction here. So his answer is that the works of God are going to be manifest in this man. Whatever did go wrong, God knew about it from the beginning. God knew about everything that was going to go wrong from the beginning. And God made a provision for everything that went wrong from the beginning. We, we can trust God. Sin wreaks so much damage and so much destruction. Truly, the wages of sin is death. And, and it's, it's downright frightening, the power of sin. But we should trust God. God knew from the beginning. The works of God are going to be manifest. And he goes on in the next verse. I must work the works of him that sent me. While this day, night comes when no one can work. Night is coming. Well, what's the problem with night? You can't see. Especially when, back in the Israel, you know, they didn't have, like, power lights. We went to India one time, Chris and I, out to a village, and you could put your hand in front of your face and barely see it, okay? Because it was night. And uh, when night comes, you can't, no one can work. And there is a night coming to this world, and it's dawning on us very fast. I believe we're in a little reprieve, but night is dawning, and it's coming down, and you've got to do what you can do while you can. And he's also teaching something else, too. Every single human being, you can take your whole lifespan. It's like a whole day. It's like a day, in a sense. It might be a, a day that lasted 57 years. It might be a day that lasted 80 years. It might be a day that lasted 12 years. It might be a day that lasted 10 years. But you know what? In a human lifestyle, you got a morning, and you got a noon, and you got a twilight, and you got an evening, and then you got the black and dark night. In other words, you only have so much time to respond to God. You got to do it while it's light. You don't want to wait until it's too dark to do anything. He says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. You got that right. And Jesus Christ at this point, in spirit is in the world, but physically he's not. He's at the right hand of God. But he said, you are the light of the world. You are the spiritual light of the world. Let me go to the next verse. We'll just kind of walk through this. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, this may, every, everything in John calls you back to Genesis. It even starts in the beginning. Okay. Everything in John start, calls you back to Genesis because the idea of the gospel is that there was, a, there was an original creation and it was good, but something happened. Night fell. The fall came. So now in Jesus comes a new creation. How many are glad for the new creation? That's what it says in a very fa famous verse, 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ... We read it, he is a new creation. And that's all right, that's a true reading. Christ makes us a new creation. But what it literally reads is, if any man be in Christ, behold a new creation. What does that mean? That means that coming into Christ means that you are a participant 
in the new creation. God's making you over. God's making me over. God's making you over. God's making the world over. God's making the environment over. God is not going to stop until, like he says in the book of Revelation, behold, I make all things new. And I'm so happy about that, right? The old is passing and the new is coming. So he spits on the ground and makes clay. Well, that's like the first, the first creation. Only this isn't a creation, but a recreation. And he, and you talk about intimate. He spits. Okay, when's the last time you ever had a preacher spit on you? Well, now you know why no one sits in the front row. <laughs> that's too close, that's too intimate. See, I've made this point before, and I'd like to make it again. In the first creation, there is a distance in everything. He says, let there be light, and by his word, light came. And let everything come into being all by the command. Let there be cattle, let there be grass, let there be trees, let there be fields, let there be the ocean, let there be the fish. But when it came to man, he does not create us by command. The creator gets down into the dirt and with his hands he forms us. It's so personal, so close. And he does something like mouth to mouth. He breathes into his nostrils. When is the last time someone breathed into your nostrils? I hope not too many people do that. The breath of life. And the woman is even more personal and even more refined. But now in the recreation, he spits in the clay and forms clay, a paste or something. And he puts them over the, the blind eyes of the man. And then he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, even the names of these places have significance. This is in the temple precincts. There's a pool, a Siloam. What does Siloam mean? Siloam means the sent, the sent one. The sent one. You know what the Greek word for that would be? That's Hebrew, Siloam, Shalom. The, he, the Greek would be the apostle. Okay. Jesus is the one the Father sent from heaven to remake us. The apostles of Jesus are the only reason you believe. You would be blind as a bat if it wasn't for the apostles. He committed everything to them. Ever notice he didn't write a book? He committed everything to the 12. And what he's t his commandment to the man blind, go wash in the pool of the apostles. Now, what do the apostles tell us? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will receive the remission of sins. So the guy makes his way to the pool of Siloam, and he washes. And it says, he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came back seeing. Oh, man. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart washed away. It was there by faith. What? I received my sight. Now I'm happy all the day. Right? And he could see now the neighbors, therefore, and they which, could be, which, which had seen him that was blind said, is this the one that sat and begged? <laughs> they can't believe it's him. Some said, this is him. Others said, no, he's like him. But he said, no, I'm him. <laughs> There's always an argument in John. Some people said, well, that's not him. It couldn't be him. He's blind as a bat. He sits around and begs. That's not him. He can see now. The others said, no, 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 that's him. And he said, no, I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore said they unto him, Then how were your eyes open? That's a good question, isn't it? How were your eyes open? Basically, what happened to you? How did you change? 
Now, at first, he didn't know that much. How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. How were your eyes open? There's a man, some man out here named Jesus. And they said unto him, where is he? He said, I don't know. See, what this is teaching about spiritual sight is that it's progressive. He didn't really know that much, but he did know Jesus. How we know when you start off the Christian life, you don't know that much. You don't have to thank the Lord. You don't have to know everything. It's enough to get your eyes open. You don't have to know everything, but you do have to know that it's Jesus, right? And for some people, that's all they know at first. It's Jesus. Where is he? I don't know. He doesn't even know where he's at. And here's where the trouble begins. <laughs> they brought him to the Pharisees that used to be blind. Now, I think this is really important to talk about the Pharisees for a minute. The word Pharisee means holy ones. They were the holy. They were the ones that could see the best. They memorized scripture and they made it their life's goal to keep all 613 of the laws of Moses. They counted them. 613. And I mean, they'd even keep law. You know, you read in the Bible about washing hands. Those are laws that apply to priests for their priestly ministry. Pharisees say, we're not taking any chances. We're going to wash our hands just like that too. They were washing their hands like surgeons before their meals. But here's the ironic thing about the Pharisees that people don't get because people look at them as that black hats. There were many sects in, in Judaism in, in the first century when Jesus came. The ones closest to Jesus in theology were the Pharisees. They were the ones that did believe, the Bible at least, they were the ones that did believe that there was a Messiah, there's a death, there's a resurrection, there's a judgment, that the Messiah was going to come. So they were the closest to Jesus. And yet, they thought they knew and they thought they saw. So they bring him before the Pharisees. And it was a Sabbath day, verse 14, when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees had a big thing about the Sabbath. The thing about the Pharisees is that for every one of the laws of God, they'd give commentaries. They would have commentaries on the laws of God, and then they develop commentaries on the commentaries about the laws of God. And then they develop commentaries of the commentaries of the commentaries about the laws of God. So they went from really knowing the law of God to being so blind to the law of God that they didn't have a clue. I'll just give you one example. The law of the Sabbath. What does the Bible say in the Ten Commandments? Uh, he uh, says, uh, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's different than every other day of the week, right? And six days shalt thou labor, and on the seventh thou shalt rest. For the Sabbath is to the Lord your God. Hey, that's simple and blessed. He gives everybody a day off and makes them take a day off and regenerate, right? Pharisees had 1,500 sub-laws governing the Sabbath. By the time they were through with it, you were so glad when it was the next day after the Sabbath, you couldn't wait for the Sabbath to get over because they made something that was a blessing to God a burden to God. Now, people in the modern day do this with the church, do this with the Bible, do this with witnessing, do this with a ton of stuff, okay? Spiritual blindness is a great, great danger. These were the back to the Bible movement of the day, but they calcified into something so blind that when the word of God came in the midst of them, they killed him. This is a warning. 
So it was the Sabbath that Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay in my eyes and I wash and now I see. <laughs> hey, everyone ought to be happy about that. Amen. He begged at the temple every day. Now he's free and can see. That should be the point, right? Nope. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man isn't of God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. He's working on the Sabbath. <laughs> this is a warning. Where if you get spiritual blindness, you can't see the point anymore. Because you're so focused on the offense. You're so focused on the hate. You're so focused on the prejudice that you don't even get the point. A normal human being, let alone a child of God, will be so happy for anyone to be liberated. But the Pharisees, experts on the law, immersed in the Word, or in the commentaries on the Word, back to the Bible movement of the day, and what do they conclude about Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God come in the flesh? He couldn't be of God working on the Sabbath. How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? There's a division among them. So, so far, the, the guy that was blind says, they say, who healed you? A man named Jesus. The guys that can see go, how can this man that's a sinner do such miracles. One says he's a man named Jesus. He blessed me. The other is talking about the same man. <laughs> the other said, man, he's a sinner. How could two people do the same thing and have such totally different co conclusions about it? How can it be so far removed from each other? It's spiritual. That's why the Bible says that to him who has eyesight, ears to hear, more will be given. You stay open and stay teachable. But to him who doesn't have, even what he thought he had will be taken away from him. No one can be static spiritually. You're either going in to light and sight and insight, or you're going into darkness. No one stays the same way. As the Bible says in Proverbs, the path of the just is as the shining of the light unto the perfect day. You begin at the peep of sunlight, a Christian life. Light, a little bit of light resurrection light on Easter morning. It just keeps going up. As you go down that path, it just keeps getting brighter and brighter. All these years later, everything's a lot more clear than it ever has been before. It goes the other way, too. The waves of the wicked is as the darkness. They're going in deeper into the dark, losing their vision as they go. They could see it one time. They could see it a lot clearer at another time. But it goes darker and darker and darker. So these guys who used to be the back to the Bible movement of the day just called Jesus a sinner. Verse 17, then they said to the blind man again, what do you say of him? Did he open your eyes? What do you think about him? Well, he's a prophet. Remember before he said he's a man, now he says he's a prophet. Man, he's got to be a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is a spokesman for God. A prophet is of God. They just called him a man and a sinner. He's, no, he's a prophet. What do you say to him that opened your eyes? Is, is, is he a sinner? No, he's a prophet. <laughs> but the Jews didn't believe concerning him that he'd been blind. Now, this is a clue as to how people become spiritually blind. 
Because believe me, it's a condition that can happen to any one of us. Why wouldn't they believe that he was blind? Pretty, it'd be pretty easy to establish that he was blind, you'd think. He sat by the temple every day. It's a public miracle. Everyone that walked by him every day giving him alms, they could verify it's the same guy. If they don't want to believe the guy, they can believe everyone. But they won't believe. No, they won't. Why? Because that doesn't fit with their narrative. They don't want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So they won't even let obvious miracles testify to it. They're committing themselves to a course, and they have no idea what the end of it is going to be, which is the deepest darkness. You can lose what you once had. You cannot see as good as you used to see. You're either on one trajectory or the other. You're either going into the greater light or the lesser light. And, and, And these Pharisees who had more light than anyone else in Israel at one time, they were the back to the Bible movement, the resistance to worldliness. They were formed in the days of Hellenization. They stood up even, they had martyrs among them for the word of God. Now they're calling... The Messiah, a sinner. And, see, this is a very, very deep verse, 18. They wouldn't believe that he had been blind. It couldn't be. It just couldn't be. They wouldn't even let themselves think it would not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight until they called their parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? <clears throat> this is really scary. Even the parents get caught up in spiritual blindness. If there be anything that you could ever say, wow, our lifelong prayer has been answered by God. God has sent this prophet Jesus into the house of God. And our son was blind from birth. Can see. Incredible. (laughs) Right? You'd think that'd be a no-brainer, don't you? But they'd already been warned. If you give any credit to Jesus, you're out of the synagogue. Now, to be kicked out of the synagogue in Judaism is to be shunned, is to be rejected. It's kind of a form of a living death. So, they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say is born blind? How does he now see? The parents answered him and said, We don't know. We know that this is our son. Yes, he is. And that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees? We don't know. (laughs) Yes, they do. You think if your son's born blind and can see and has a talk with you, you think you're going to say, hey, how'd this happen? (laughs) Of course you are. How did this happen? A man named Jesus. Mom, Dad, he's a prophet. But then when they get called up, and the Bible says every one of us will be called up to make a good confession. Then when they get called up, These words spake his parents, 22, because they feared the Jews. Well, there's a good way to get spiritually blind. The fear of man. The fear of man is a snare. You try to please man, you will lose your sight. Sight is a beautiful gift from God. I'm so glad I could see that Jesus is real and that there's a heaven to gain, a hell to shun, that sin is evil, but that there's a solution to it. Man, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. You give in to fear of man, that'll all be taken away. People that fear man now, churches that accommodate things they know isn't right. It's not, it's not right, but because they want to look good. Because remember, the fear of man doesn't just mean craven terror. It also means to regard man. In other words, to try to get the pleasure of man, to try to get the approval of man, to try to earn the applause of man. That is the fear of man too. Many, many people 
they once saw of losing their sight because they're afraid of losing that. So these words, he says, he's of age. Ask him. Let him speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Notice that. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. You know, you know what comes to my mind as I read that? Jesus said, beware of blind guides leading the blind. Where does it end up? In the pit. Blind guides leading the blind. So these Pharisees that they were following, and they were so eager to please that they actually denied the one who blessed their son. Now they're going down the same road the Pharisees are going down. Well, we go on. Did you know at first the Pharisees loved John the Baptist? At first they believed in him. They felt he was speaking for them. What's happened? What happens? Not how you start out. How you finish. Goes on. Therefore, as said his parents, he's of age, ask him in 24. Then they called the, the man that was blind and said to him, Come on, give God the praise. We know this man's a sinner. By the way, when they say this man's a sinner, they're not saying it the way we say it, because one of the problems with Phariseeism and first century Judaism, they didn't believe in original sin. Sinner is a technical term to them. That means he is a blatant transgressor. The publicans and sinners referred to prostitutes, tax collectors. And in this case, Jesus is a sinner to them. And they want to make him confess that Jesus is a sinner because Jesus is a Sabbath breaker. And of course, in their mind, a false prophet. Come on, give God the glory. Confess that this man is a sinner. And that's what spiritual darkness is going to try to do, too. And this is how many are descending into spiritual darkness. You know what? Uh, political correctness is not just a little irritating fad. It's actually a spiritual warfare. Here's how it works. God called us to live in this world to confess to the truth. Now, what truth? Because there's a lot of truth in there. What truth in particular? That truth that the spirit of Antichrist is currently contesting. How about the truth about marriage? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. There's no such thing as gay marriage. How about the truth about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ? All religions don't lead to heaven. There's only one. How about the truth about life? Did anyone see the senators give each other the high five after knocking down a law that the Congress passed against late-term abortion? <laughs> Way to go, buddy! Life. We're to confess to it. But political correctness, which is actually spiritual warfare, isn't content just shutting our mouth. No. They go further. They're going to make you confess to what you know isn't true, if they can. And that is another avenue into spiritual darkness. Come on, confess. Jesus is a sinner. Give the glory to God. He says, verse 25, he answered and said, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I don't know. There's only one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Now he develops this in later debate with them. Then they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I already told you. You didn't hear. 
And that's a good way into spiritual blindness, refusal to hear. Why would you hear it again? You want to be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple. But we're Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't know where he comes from. Now, let me elaborate on that. Because in their way, they just said something stronger about him. Remember, first they said he's a man and he's a sinner. He's a false prophet. (laughs) But when they said, we don't know where he comes from, they're making an allusion to the scandal that surrounded the virgin birth. They're basically saying, he is a bastard. He is a bastard, which is what the rumor was. We don't know who his father is. He's a bastard. See, this is the way darkness goes. You go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. You lose sight of who he is. (coughs) And even worse, (coughs) you can't see anything but evil about him. Or you can't say. It just keeps tumbling out your mouth. Worse. Abuse of Jesus or the holy. We don't know where he comes from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing. You don't know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, oh, that's who he hears. Oh, this man just said something stronger about Jesus. Remember, first he said, I don't know really who he is. I don't know where he is. His name is Jesus. He healed my eyes. He's a prophet. He's a good man. (laughs) He healed me. God hears his prayers. Because he's a worshiper of God. See, his sight is getting better. Their sight is being taken away. Now we, okay, go on. If this man were not of God, he couldn't do anything. It's all as clear as a bell to him. They answered and said unto him, you are all together born in sins, and you're going to teach us? Well, they called him a bastard. See? The darkness, the hatred, the prejudice. Let me read a passage in the epistle of John, then I'll go back to John 9, so hold your finger there, but in 1 John chapter 2, same apostle, he had this, this same, this revelation, 1 chapter 2, it says, verse 8, again a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. How many are glad of that? (laughs) But he that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother remains in the light and there's no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he's going because that darkness has blinded his eyes. This this is real. This is the word of God to Christians. Go back to John 9. I'm going to try to... He says... In 34, they, oh, they, they cast him out. 34, they, when, they, when it says they cast him out, that means they excommunicated him. They put him out of fellowship. They banished him from God. <laughs> Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Do you believe on the Son of God? It's time for the vision to be more complete. He's a man. He healed me. 
don't know where he is. He's a good man. He's a prophet. He's a worshiper of God. Come to take it up another level. He says, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said unto him, you've both seen him, and it's he that talks with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. You know, when you know your sight is complete, when you worship him, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the remission of our sins. I believe that Jesus is the only way. See, we're going to keep on seeing him for, forever. <laughs> Praise God. And Jesus said, for judgment I come into this world. Now that word judgment is a word that means crisis. In other words, it's a crisis now. Everything's going to go one way or the other. Nothing stays the same. Crisis means everything goes to the left or the right, into the dark or the light. There's no status. Crisis. For judgment I came into the world. That they which see not might see. And they which see might be made blind. What? Oh, the back to the Bible movement of the day. They really got it when worldliness just flooded Israel and when almost no one stood for God. They really went back to the Bible. They really stood for the word of God. They resisted unto death. Man, they could just see so clearly. Now they're calling the son of God <coughs> a bastard. Now they refuse to know <coughs> what they could have seen with their eyes right in front of them. This guy really was blind, and he really does see, and Jesus did it. Nope. That's how spiritual blindness comes, prejudice. You judge a matter before you even have the facts. That's the sure guide to spiritual blindness. And pride. They love the praise. Of, they couldn't believe, as John says. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They're more concerned about what men thought. All that matters is what men thought. They weren't caring about what God thought. It's all about what man thinks, for good or evil. It's looking good. False loyalty. Well, we always taught, we, we, we didn't think the Messiah would be like this. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter what we think. I mean, what's the Bible saying? <laughs> nope. So you ignore truth? even mock truth. You can get cynical and think that nothing's true anymore, that everything's just a joke. This is, this is, I mean, God can heal this. God can give us back our sight again. This is what I'm always asking God, give me back my sight. We all have this stuff. <clears throat> those that see might not, might, those that see now might see and those which see might be made blind. Literally, you're going to blind them? <laughs> it's not that he's going to reach out his hand and blind them. It's that he being who he is, their rejection of him, their mockery of him, their ridicule of him, their prejudice against him. That's what's blinding them. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. It's one thing to say, you know, I don't know. I don't get it. I got all these passions. I got all these ideas. I got all these prejudices. But really, I don't know. It's another to say, I know. And I'm going to ignore everything that goes against my narrative. Isn't that, isn't that what happened um, last fall with the left? 
when they shut everyone up from telling them what they really thought, so they, they, that they thought all the Poles were going to let them have the power, and, and they became hoisted on their own petard. They blinded themselves by their own prejudice to the point where they had no idea what was coming. That is a spiritual shadow what's happening to the whole world. Father, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes. Take us out of the path of darkness. Turn us around. Take us away from hatred and prejudice, mockery, scorn, reproach, all the marks of spiritual blindness. Let us love one another always. And let us walk after you. And let us admit that we don't see so that we can see. And let us not be willful for many things, O Lord God, we offend and hurt, but O God, let us not make each other stumble. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.